Good evening, ladies. We are on Galatians chapter 2 right now, and if you haven't done your Bible study yet, you can just open up your Bible to Galatians chapter 2. And if you're looking for a copy of the free study guide, you can go to my blog at timewarpwife.com and uh, just click on the first post there that you see, and you'll be able to download a copy of the Galatians Bible study guide. So I thought I would just pop in and discuss some of my answers with you today since it's Friday. And just a reminder that for the Bible study of Galatians, we're doing two chapters per week because there are only six chapters in the book of Galatians. So today we're on Galatians chapter two. And um, I don't know why, but it seems like uh, this past year, God has really been uh, directing me to understand the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles. And first of all, he led me to uh, the Bible study that we had on Exodus. And you can find that study guide on my blog too. But in Exodus, we learned all about the uh, receiving of the law and um, uh, God setting up the, uh, the tent of the tabernacle in the desert. And we learned a lot about that that first group of um, followers and their relationship with God and how God led them and how they were uh, went through times of testing in the desert and that was pretty cool and then we went over to Romans and that was a real eye-opener for me as I started to learn that um, the relationship that we have with the Jews is one of adoption we're adopted into their family and so we haven't replaced the Jews by any means but we now we've been grafted in so that we're all one family in the family of God and the Bible says there is no more Jew nor Gentile and that means that yes there are physically still going to be Jewish people who are born of Jewish descent but when we are grafted into God's family we become one in the spirit with them and so now we are on Galatians chapter 2, and again, we're reading about the Jews and the Gentiles. So I'm starting to think, God, are you trying to tell me something? And I think he is, because I'm working on this Bible study right now, which is called The Beauty of Jesus Revealed in the Feasts. And there is just so much in the uh, chapter of Leviticus 23 about the feasts, that um, there is to be learned when we see the reflection of Christ, both in the Jewish feasts and in the law and the commandments and the entire New Testament, right from Genesis chapter one, actually, we see Jesus being revealed in the Old Testament. And so um, this is fun. I'm finding this journey of learning to be uh, really refreshing and, um, I love it and I think that I thank God that he's guiding our steps and showing us where to go next so anyway let's get back to Galatians chapter 2 the first question we had is how long had it been since Paul got saved according to verse 1 well I wanted you to think a little bit deeper there and you have to look back to the previous chapter 2 or the previous chapter Galatians chapter 1 in order to get a full picture of that one the timing of the events in Galatians chapter 2 would seem to take place 14 years after Paul was converted. However, if you add the three years found in Galatians 1.18, then you had a, a total of 17 years. And when this takes place, Paul's talking about an event in Galatians chapter 2. And that's what I'm referring to when we ask how long had it been since Paul got saved. What did uh, Paul's... Uh, no, why did Paul approach the church leaders no sorry let me word that once again I keep reading my question wrong what did Paul approach the church leaders about in private he wanted to present them with the message that he was preaching to the Gentiles and as he said I'm preaching to the Gentiles and Peter is preaching to the Jews and they understood that at the time and he also wanted to reveal God's mission in him I think one thing that I really admire about Paul is that, um, and especially in this chapter, is how iron sharpens iron. And so we see Paul getting together with the apostles to make sure that they're on the right track and to sharpen each other in the faith, which we're going to read about a little later in this chapter. Karen Corny or Gorney says, I am really enjoying being able to see and hear you teaching in person. I love seeing your comments too. 
Lenise Krebs joined. Hi, Lenise. Lenise is Pastor Dan's wife, and he's the one that I'm working on the next book with. So it's really nice to see you here too, Lenise. And uh, yes, iron sharpens iron, she says. Exactly. So um, how did Paul's ministry differ from that of Peter's? And I think I just said that in the previous question, that Paul was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and Peter was ministering to the Jews. But what's really interesting is that Peter helped to usher in the first Gentile converts. And I think that was in Acts chapter 10. I will get to that a little bit later. But this was a lesson that was really important for Peter to learn. God had given him a vision in the book of Acts. And uh, he showed uh, this blanket with all of these unclean animals. And God said to him, eat. And Peter was like, no, I, I can't eat that. That's unclean. I've never eaten an unclean animal. And God said, eat. And what Peter finally understood from this vision is that um, there weren't any, that Gentiles were not unclean and Jews were clean, but that all are made righteous through Jesus Christ. And so this isn't something that was just a message for Peter alone, I would say, but that was a message for Paul alone, I should say. But it was Paul's mission to preach to the Gentiles. So God wanted the other disciples to understand this as well. What does Paul mean in verse 4 when he says that they might bring us into bondage? What were these spies trying to achieve? There were some spies that were spying on the apostles and, and it said that they were looking at their, um, their liberties. And what they were trying to achieve is that, is that they were trying to hold the disciples accountable to the Mosaic law. When they had already been freed from that law of ceremonial cleansings and sacrifices and all of its traditions. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law to all who believe. You can't serve two masters. Either you believe that you are justified by the works of the law, which some Jews at that time had still believed. They didn't believe that you are justified justified through faith in Jesus Christ. They thought, no, no, no. I mean, you have to believe in Jesus, but you still have to have the works of the law or you're not going to be justified. And so that is what they were trying to pull the early church back into believing and trying to give them these messages that, no, you still have to be circumcised and you still have to follow the Mosaic law because righteousness comes by the law or so they thought. But um, one of the questions that we have in this chapter is uh, what is the only thing that saves? And that is faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible says, By grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so it wasn't the law that saved them in the Old Testament. The law was just to point them to the one that would save them. And that was all complete when Jesus Christ died on the cross. What made Peter revert back to his legalistic attitude and actions that he once forsook. Okay, so that question, what it's talking about is in this chapter of Galatians chapter two, we see that Paul confronted Peter because when the Jews came to visit the church, he would no longer eat with the Gentiles. And so Peter was trying to avoid conflict. He knew that these Jews wouldn't understand because they didn't have the revelation that Peter did. And so in order to just avoid the conflict, instead of eating with the Gentiles, he was being a hypocrite and he would go and eat with the Jews. So there again, we see iron sharpening iron, which is so important. It was important for the early church and it's important for us. And that um, Paul was there and Paul set him straight. And, uh, and so Peter could understand that, yeah, I, maybe I didn't realize I was doing this, but I'm avoiding conflict. And I think sometimes um, we can be hypocrites as well in our faith, can't we? Because we avoid conflict when we know what we should, the right thing to do, and yet we just don't do it because maybe people around us aren't or we are affected by peer pressure, I think is a good word to use in this case. So here's what I wrote, and I, I touched on this earlier today, and I'm going to just say how I wrote it because... I'm far better at writing than I'll ever be at speaking. So here is how I put it. In Acts chapter 10, God gave Peter a vision through which he taught Peter 
that the Gentiles were not unpure or unclean. Immediately, Peter understood that Jews were not forbidden to associate with Gentiles. In fact, Peter said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. That's Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Peter understood that the Gentiles were called to salvation. In fact, he was instrumental in ushering the first Gentile converts into Christianity in Acts chapter 11. And it, it starts in Acts chapter 10. The reason that Peter reverted back to his old ways then was the peer pressure. He, um, just like he had denied Christ after um, his death on the cross, there's still that weakness inside each one of us, and um, and sometimes we need other Christians to um, sharpen us, to remind us um, to stand strong in our faith, and to um, to share our faith with each other. So that is how Paul was really instrumental in Peter's life, and I know that the disciples were also also instrumental in Paul's life and encouraging him in the faith. And so he had this meeting with them, which was, um, I think it was verse one said, um, 14 years after Paul was converted, he went and spent time with them. But three years after Paul was converted, he went and spent time with Peter too. So um, he didn't wait that long. But uh, the reason that was really important too is because the book of Galatians, Paul is establishing himself as an apostle to the Galatians church because there were naysayers in uh, that were speaking to the Galatians and telling them that Paul didn't have the authority to teach them the way that he was teaching them. So Paul's using this testimony in uh, Galatians chapter 2 to show that, yes, he was um, spent time with the apostles. He was a he told them what his mission was. He was approved by the apostles. He, um, he would, in fact, shared with Peter and helped to strengthen Peter in his faith. So Paul wasn't just a, another believer who they maybe in the early church would be going, you know, I don't know if I can believe this person or, or can't. I'm not sure if his doctrine is right or not. But Paul is saying here, I went and I spent time with the apostles and I told them what my mission was, and they knew very well what my mission was, and he explained it all to them, and they confirmed it in him. And um, that's what makes Paul um, really stand out from the naysayers that we see in Galatians chapter 2, who are saying, no, 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 uh, Galatians church, you have to be circumcised. You have to follow the law, because righteousness, they thought, didn't come through faith alone. And Paul is saying, yes, it does. Yes, it does. And I think that, I think Paul's pretty cool. I'm a huge fan of the Apostle Paul. But then again, who isn't, right? <laughs> so um, what is the only thing that saves? Again, it's our faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and when we do have faith in Jesus Christ, we do, as he says, we understand that we must repent and that we must be baptized. And we understand that we must call him Lord because we believe not only what he did on the cross, but we believe in who he was. We believe that he is God, that he is um, God's only begotten son, that they are one in the spirit, and, um, and that he is authority in our life. Explain justification. That's our last question. Um, my sister used to tell us when we were little kids, she would say, um, justification is just as if I never sinned and I think that was always a good way to remember it but um, dictionary.com says the act of whereby humankind is made or accounted just or free from guilt or the penalty of sin so when we are justified through Jesus Christ I hope that my phone isn't dying out all of a sudden my phone decided to do an update that's crazy. Anyway, um, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we are justified and he takes away our sin. And that is what really unites us with God. Because if we remember from our Bible study in Romans, which we had last time, 
um, sin separated right from the very beginning when Adam and Eve separate uh, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden they were separated from God and that separation was carried on from generation to generation and so now when we are justified through faith in Jesus Christ that bridge is finally back in place and we're united with the Father and we can come to him through Jesus and that was his entire mission on the earth that he would unite us with God and uh, it, it's just so profound. I think when we start to really understand how much God loved us and that we were sinners well, he loved us and that he sent his son despite all of the sin that we had in our lives and that um, we have freedom now and we have the authority through Jesus Christ to serve God our Father and there's no more separation.